Welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs Mini Podcast. My name is Tim DeForest, and with this episode, we're going to continue our look at the novel The Lost World, written by Arthur Conan Doyle in the year 1912. Now, if you haven't heard the previous two episodes yet, which cover the first eight chapters, I would suggest you pause here and listen to them, as we're going to be diving right into chapter nine. And that chapter begins, a dreadful thing has happened to us. Who could have foreseen it? I cannot foresee any end to, to our troubles. It may be that we are condemned to spend our whole lives in this strange, inaccessible place. I am still so confused that I can hardly think clearly of the facts uh, of the present or of the chances of the future. To my astonished senses, the one seemed most terrible and the other as black as night." Unquote. Now, this is a wonderful bit of foreshadowing, or perhaps it's too overt to be described as foreshadowing. In any case, it's a paragraph that immediately grabs your attention and pulls you farther into the story. Now, the last chapter, chapter eight, ended with Malone sending what uh, he had so far written back to civilization by messenger. So obviously we've had a time jump here with bad stuff that happened in the interval. Malone then gives us a flashback. We learn that the party had reached the plateau and camped at its foot. We get a hint that Summerlee might be starting to believe Challenger's story. In the morning, the party discusses what to do next. Once again, this directly from the novel. Quote, Challenger presided with solemn, solemnity as if he were the Lord Chief Justice on the bench. Picture him seated upon a rock, his absurd boyish straw hat tilted on the back of his head, his supercilious eyes dominating us from under his drooping lids, his great black beard wagging as it slowly defined our present situation and our future movements. Beneath him, you might have seen the three of us, myself, sunburnt, young and vigorous after our open-air tramp, Summerly, solemn but still critical, behind his eternal pipe, Lord John, as keen as a razor, razor edge, with his supple, alert figure leaning upon his rifle and his eager eyes fixed eagerly upon the speaker. Behind us were grouped the two swarthy half-breeds and the little knot of, knot of Indians, while in front and above us ta towered those huge, ruddy ribs of rock which kept us from our goal." Unquote. And once again, we see how effectively Doyle sets the scene and almost casually reminds us of who is present. Now Challenger and Summerlee continue to snark at each other, but the party eventually decides to circle the plateau at its foot to see if they can find a way up. Challenger is convinced there is a way because Maple White, White had somehow gotten up and then down again. Soon they find a human skeleton along with a cigarette case that has the initials JC engraved on it. Challenger realizes this must be the remains of James Culver, a companion of Maple White. Now, this is the first mention of Culver, and though I'm going to continue to praise the book as an example of great storytelling, I think you can consider Challenger's sudden knowledge of Culver to be a slight glitch in the storytelling process. Challenger said he learned about Culver when asking about Maple White earlier in the trip before he rejoined the others. That's fine by itself, but this knowledge would, would seem to be a little less contrived if it had been shared with the readers a little earlier. As it stands, it seems that Doyle is pulling a new character out of thin air. But the validity of my point here is, is arguable since it's perfectly within character for Challenger not to be bothered to tell anyone about Culver. And it is indeed an eerie scene. Jo Lord John realizes that Culver had been thrown off or had jumped off the top of the plateau and impaled upon tall bamboo. It's not a nice way to die. So the party continues to circle the plateau. They find chalk, chalk markings apparently left by Maple White to indicate they're going in the right direction. This is all very encouraging. But when they find a cave entrance that must have been White's route to the top, they find that it's been blocked by a rockfall. They continue to circle the plateau, but they find no other way up. The plateau now seems to be truly inaccessible. That night though, while their dinner is cooking uh, on a campfire, something happens that leads to one of the most dramatic moments in the book. 
And also, well, I guess you would have to say one of the sweetest moments in the book as well. Quote, suddenly, out of the darkness, out of the night, there swooped something with a swish like an airplane. The whole group of us were covered for an instant by a canopy of leathery wings, and I had a momentary vision of a long, snake-like neck, a fierce red greedy eye, greedy eye, and a great snapping beak, filled, to my amazement, with little gleaming teeth. The next instant it was gone, and so was our dinner. A huge black shadow, twenty feet across, skimmed up into the air. For an instant the monster wings blotted out the stars, and then it vanished over the brow of the cliff above us. We all sat in amazed silence round the fire, like the heroes of Virgil when the harpies came, upon, uh, came down upon them. It was Summerlee who was the first to speak. Professor Challenger, he said, in a solemn voice, which quavered with emotion. I owe you an apology. Sir, I am very much in the wrong, and I beg that you will forget what is past. It was handsomely said, and the two men for the first time shook hands. So much we have gained by this clear vision of our first pterodactyl. It was worth a stolen supper to bring two such men together." Unquote. And it really is a nice moment, kind of a sweet moment, as I said, showing that for all their egotism, bad temper, and downright childishness, both Summerlee and Challenger are men of honor at heart. Now, the next morning, there was a little more foreshadowing. Has, since they found no runoffs for rainwater, they, they deduced that there must be a central lake on the plateau. More importantly, though, Challenger comes up with a plan to get to the top. They can climb the pinnacle next to the plateau and cut down the large tree atop that pinnacle to make a bridge. This plan is carry, carried out very quickly, uh, but when Challenger claims the honor of being the first to cross their makeshift bridge, Lord John calls him out on this, feeling that he and Malone should fetch up their guns and other supplies before the bridge is crossed. Challenger, as we see, doesn't care to be contradicted. Quote, Challenger sat down on the cut stump and groaned his impatience. But Summerlee and I were of one mind that Lord John was our leader when such practical details were in question. The climb was a more simple thing now that a rope dangled down the face of the worst part of the ascent. Within an hour, we had brought up the rifles and a shotgun. The half-breeds had ascended also, and under Lord John's orders, they had carried up a bale of provisions in case our first exploration should be a long one. We each had bandoliers of cartridges. Now, Challenger, if you really insist on being the first man in, said Lord John, when, everyone, when every preparation was complete, I am much indebted to you for your gracious permission, said the angry professor, for never was a man more intolerant of every form of authority. Since you are good enough to allow it, I shall most certainly take it upon myself to act as pioneer upon this occasion. Unquote. So you know, sometimes it just seems like Professor Challenger needs a nice long time out, doesn't it? Now that men with rifles can give him cover if necessary, Challenger is the first one to cross. The others join him. But then the bridge behind them crashes down to the ground far below, leaving them trapped on the plateau. One of their assistants, Gomez, had pushed the bridge uh, over. Like all good villains, he gloats about why he did this. It turns out that the leader of the slavers that Lord John had killed years earlier was Gomez's brother. Now he had his revenge. So we see Doyle's skill at long-term plotting. Uh, Lord John's adventures in wiping out a slave ring and killing the leader of the slavery had been met, a slave of the slavers had been mentioned several chapters earlier, and now we see this culminates in an act of revenge that leaves Lord John and his friends trapped on the plateau. Now Gomez's feelings of vengeance are short-lived, as he is himself, though. Of course, Lord John shoots and kills him. Uh, the party looks down to see Zambo kill Gomez's partner. Zambo then climbs the pinnacle to have, to, to have a shouted conversation with the stranded party. There's not much Zambo can do, though. Uh, he does promise to stick around just in case something comes up that he can do. And he also promises to send Malone's latest report back via the Indian bearers. So after this long, intense chapter, 
Doyle begins chapter 10 with a little humor. When Malone is grossed out to find he has a blood tick on his ankle, Challenger tells him to buck up and take a calm, scientific view of such things. He criticizes Malone for squashing the tick before they could study it, since it's probably a new species. When Summerlee then tells Challenger that a tick has just crawled down his shirt, his reaction is hilarious. Quote, Challenger sprang into the air, bellowing like a bull, and tore frantically at his, at his coat and shirt to get them off. Summerlee and I laughed so that we could hardly help him. At last, we exposed that monstrous torso, 54 inches, by, a, by, a, by the tailor's tape. His body was all matted with black hair, out of which uh, jungle we picked the wandering tick before it had bitten him. But the bushes around were full of the horrible pests, and it was clear that we must shift our camp. So they do shift their camp. They find a spot that can be ringed with thorny bushes, thus setting up a relatively safe base camp. As they prepare to explore, Challenger declares that the plateau must be called Maple White Land, another indication that the professor does allow his sense of honor to take precedent over his ego when that's clearly the right thing to do. The ensuing exploration still soon pays off. They discover a family of iguanodonts, and soon after that, they find a swamp where the pterodactyls hang out. It's really an awesome series of discoveries, and, and Doyle's description of, of it is just really almost awe-inspiring. Uh, but this doesn't stop Challenger and Summerlee from arguing over the interpretations of what they observe. Not surprisingly, that leads to trouble. But once again, this is directly from the novel. Finally, however, Challenger, bent upon, improving, bent upon proving some point which Summerlee had contested, thrust his head over the rock, and nearly brought destruction upon us all. In an instant, the nearest male gave a shrill, whistling cry and flapped its 20-foot span of leathery wings as it soared up into the air. The females and young ones huddled together beside the water while the whole circle of sentinels rose one after another and sailed off into the sky. It was a wonderful sight to see, at least a hundred creatures of such enormous size and hideous appearance, all swooping like swallows with swift shearing wing, wing strokes above us. But soon we realized that it was not one on which we could afford to linger. At first, the great brutes flew around in a huge ring as if to make sure what the exact extent of the danger might be. Then the flight grew lower and the circle narrower until they were whizzing round and round us, the dry, f the rustling flap of their huge slate-colored wings filling the air with a volume of sound that made me think of Hendon, the, the, of Hendon Aerodrome upon a race day. Make for the wood and keep together, cried Lord John, clubbing his rifle. The brutes mean mischief. So the party barely escapes injury or death. They return to their camp, where we get some more foreshadowing that sets up a future plot point. Roxton makes a point of saying there was blue clay in a volcanic vent near the pterodactyl rookery. What this means will be explained in a future chapter. Now, chapter 11 starts with a very creepy moment, as during the night, the party hears a battle of titans taking place in the darkness. Quote, I know no sound to which I could compare the, this amazing tumult which seemed to come from some spot within a few hundred yards of our camp. It was as ear-splitting as any whistle of a railway, a railway engine, but whereas the whistle is a clear, mechanical, sharp-edged sound, this was far deeper in volume and vibrant with the uttermost strain of agony and horror. We clapped our hands to our ears to shut out that nerve-shaking appeal, nerve appeal. A cold sweat broke out all over my body, and my heart turned sick at the misery of it. All the woes of tortured life, all its stupendous indictment of high heaven, its innumerable sorrows, seem to be centered and condensed in that one dreadful, agonized cry. And then, under this high-pitched ringing sound, there was another, more intermittent, a low, deep-chested laugh, a growling, throaty gurgle of merriment, which formed a grotesque accompaniment to the shriek with which it was blended. For three or four minutes on end, the fearsome duet continued, while all the foliage rustled with the rising of, of startled birds. Then it shut off as suddenly as it began. For a long time, we sat in horrified silence. 
This evocative and exciting paragraph is one of my favorite paragraphs of all time. But it, is, it doesn't end there. Soon after that, a dinosaur approaches their camp. Quote, in the deep shadow of the tree, there was a deeper shadow yet, black, and show it, vague, a crouching form full of savage vigor and menace. It was no higher than a horse, but the dim outline suggested vast bulk and strength. That hissing pant, as regular and full-volumed as the exhaust of an engine, spoke of a monstrous organism. Once, as it moved, I thought I saw the glint of two terrible greenish eyes. There was an uneasy rustling, as if it were crawling slowly forward. Unquote. Now, not wanting to risk the sound of a shot, Lord John shoves a torch in the dinosaur's face, chasing it off. Now, this, of course, leads to Summerlee and Challenger discussing what species of dinosaur might have, that it might have been. Now, it's interesting to note, though, that they do this without a lot of their usual snarkiness. The two men are on their way to mutual respect and to actually becoming friends. Even the next morning, when they discuss whether to explore for the sake of exploration or first look for a way to escape from the plateau, they remain largely snark-free. Malone spots a tall tree and volunteers to climb it. This task, though, is not without incident. Quote, a face was gazing into mine at the distance of only a foot or two. The creature that owned it had been crouching behind the parasite and it looked around at the same instant that I did. It was a human face, or at least it was far more human than any monkeys that I had ever seen. It was long, whitish, and blotched with pimples. The nose flattened and the lower jaw projecting, with a bristle of coarse whiskers round the chin. The eyes, which were under thick and heavy brows, were bestial and ferocious. And as it opened its mouth to snarl, what, uh, what, so what sounded like a curse at me, I observed that it had curved, sharp canine teeth. For an instant, I read hatred and menace in the evil eyes. When s then, as quick as a flash, came an expression of overpowering fear. There was a crash of broken bows as it dived wildly down into the tangle of green. I caught a glimpse of a hairy body, like that of a reddish pig, and then it was gone amid a swirl of leaves and branches. Now, this, another great paragraph, by the way, is the first glimpse of one of the eight men that will be the primary antagonist for most of the rest of the novel. So Malone continues his climb, and he spots the large central lake they had theorized about earlier, and far in the distance, he catches a glimpse of what we, learn, we later learn are the caves in which the Indians live. At this point, though, they don't see, at this distance, they don't see any sign of habitation. Having Malone climb that tree serves a number of effective storytelling purposes. It gives Malone something to do other than simply chronicle their adventures. It gives us an overview of the plateau, the setting for most of the rest of the novel. And it begins to establish the existence of both the ape men and the Indians. Now, Summerlee and Challenger, of course, debate the nature of the ape man that Malone saw. Now, I, I hope I'm not giving the, giving the impression that these constant exchanges between the two professors are dry or that they interrupt the flow of the story. Instead, they're invariably fun to read, demonstrating both men's vivid personalities and allowing us to trace their growing friendship with one another, even as they still continue to disagree at times. Now, Malone is told that he gets to name the lake. He decides on Lake Gladys, giving us perhaps an overdue reminder of how the young reporter ended up on the plateau at all and what his ultimate goal is to impress Gladys and win her hand in marriage. So chapter 12 starts with Malone feeling proud of himself over having helped out by climbing the tree. He's also, also thinking about impressing Gladys and bringing back an even bigger story to his editor. The end result is that when Summerlee falls asleep while on watch that night, Malone goes off on, uh, alone to explore. He takes a gun and he has a pocket full of rifle cartridges, though we soon learn that he's accidentally picked up a shotgun rather than a rifle, so he, he has no ammunition that he can use. He's effectively unarmed. 
Before he realizes his mistake, though, he comes within sight of the caves that he had seen from the distance well up the tree. Now he can see fires burning in those caves, an indication that human be beings do live on the plateau. This is big news. But in another truly exciting scene, he's spotted by a dinosaur on the way back to camp. Without a usable weapon, he just runs for it, and he falls into a pit trap and knocks himself out. And when he wakes up, he realizes that the trap is man-made, and it had a sharpened pole in the center to impale any big creatures that fall into it. Man, muses Malone, always, was always the master. He climbs out of the pit. Now soon after, as the sun rises, he hears a single rifle shot in the distance. And then when he returns to camp, quoting from the book, in the cold morning light, it was a fearful sight which met my eyes. Our effects were scattered in wild confusion over the ground. My comrades had disappeared, and close to the smoldering ashes of our fire, the grass was stained crimson with a hideous pool of blood. So Malone has no idea what happened to his companions. He returns to the pinnacle and has another shouted conversation with Zambo, who suggests sending a messenger back to civilization to bring ropes with which to bridge the gap. This is actually a good plan, and Malone likes the idea. And it ends the cha uh, he ends the chapter by throwing a letter and what few coins he has over to Zambo. Uh, in the, a previous podcast, we did talk about Zambo being portrayed as a racial stereotype in some ways. His dialogue here continues to be stereotypical. But at the same time, it's Zambo who comes up with a constructive plan. Once again, it's up to the individual readers to decide for themselves what Doyle's ultimate attitude towards Zambo and his race might have been. Now, these four chapters pick up the pace of the story. They advance the plot. They add to the characterizations of our protagonists and they contain a number of truly exciting action set pieces. Now, that's it for this time. We'll be returning again soon for one more uh, podcast on the Lost World as we cover the last four chapters. Until then, once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Uh, please keep an ear out for future episodes of our full-length podcast that I do with Jess Terrell and Scott Stewart, in which we talk about one of Edgar Rice Burroughs' works in detail. And please visit my blog at Comics, Old Time Radio, and other cool stuff, where you can also find links to my books on, uh, on Amazon.com. Um, thank you, as always, for listening. We always appreciate our listeners, and we will ba be back again soon.